And I also want to do, um, let me ask, does any, I'm going to do a, a live transcript um, for people who want to experience this interview and who have any kind of hearing impairment. So you're going to see some words at the bottom. I hope that's not too distracting. So let me rewind myself. Um, this is the Pro Culturator series, and this is an interview with Z Griss, uh, founder of Embody More Love, which you can find at embodymorelove.com. And Z is going to tell you more about their work as we get into it. Um, but I want to say a word um, first about the Pro Culturator series. Um, Pro Culturators is not exactly a made up word, but a reclaimed word. And the way that it came about was that I took very seriously um, Res Momenicum's ask to white people to create anti-racist white culture. And Res Momenicum is the author of My Grandmother's Hands and um, does a lot of work with somatic abolitionism, somatic means of the body. But I kind of, the anti, create anti was kind of sticking in my craw. And I was also aware that, that movements throughout history did better when they um, embraced a pro something that sort of organically sloughed off the thing that it, they were trying to eradicate. Um, for example, uh, I don't know too many potential rapists who sign up to learn not to rape. However, mm -hmm. Um, a lot of them are signing up for consent culture because it sounds pretty juicy. And in the course of learning tenets of consent, learn how to avoid sexual harm. Um, people on the right know this when they, you know, wanted to oppose abortion and they came up with the term pro-life. So pro-culturate means to proactively create a juicy culture of human connection um, that when we get into it, kind of um, organically dissolves racism. How do we do that? Well, I know someone, <laughs> <laughs> only we had someone on board who knows something about all this. See, I just love um, your, your journey and how you came from a more kind of intellectual space and then experienced a profound life event and came out in a very different place. So I wonder if you could want to maybe start by sharing something about where you were and what happened and where you came to. Yeah, thank you. And I also want to acknowledge that there are folks um, in this room that I've been learning and growing and collaborating with in this conversation over the last two decades. So I'm just really grateful that we're in a community conversation because I don't have all the answers and I'm just energized to be here with you. and. Um, at some point would love to share the image of the values that, that connects so much to what you just said. Um, and um, many of you might've known I, I had a brain injury um, the week that shelter in place started. <laughs> it was a big week, <laughs> um, so it was two years ago now and um, it literally hurt to think like when when the executive functioning of my brain was wanting to figure something out, I would have pain. And so I had this immediate feedback loop um, of what my brain was doing in a different way than I had ever had before. And so at that point, I had been 20 years into what is it like to do anti-racism work? And I kept thinking, well, if only I could figure out the things people need to hear to love each other better. And then during that year, it was like, oh, we could just start loving each other better. We may or may not get to figuring out all the things we need to say or hear. And it's not that we're giving up on that inquiry. I had to live from my heart in a very different way during that year. And then slowly I started to regain executive functioning in my brain. And during the out of that was birthed like the latest evolution of my race work, which is called waking the heart of our human family. And it is rooted in, first of all, simply being a human family, which already changes where we're coming from in the conversation. And it is rooted in compassion and presence and co-presencing skills that allow us to stay connected even when 
traumas in the space or coming through one or many people? How do we still come back into a relation together as a human family? Yeah. I thank you for bringing, feels to me like you're actually bringing the essence of that work into the field of this moment. I'm feeling nourished by that. I'm breathing it in and drinking it in. I want to invite other people to to do the same if you aren't already. Yeah, thank you. And also I need to name that the way my brain works, it, it, it's slower for me to read the chat. So if I'm quiet for a minute, it's because I'm switching over to read the chat. Yeah. And is it possible, Jill, to be able, if you could allow me to share the screen? Is that? Yeah, one second. Okay, great. I have to find you and click on something, I think. Yeah. I think you I make you co-host. Yeah, that'll do it. Okay. Awesome. Let me know if that little screen share screen arrow pops up. It's working. Okay. Yeah. So this is. Can you all see my screen? I love what you said, Jill, about the pro something. So I want to say that I've been polyamorous for 20 years and um, Jessica Fern wrote this amazing book called Polysecure. And I thought, oh, this is about how we love multiple people at the same time. Sounds like being human, you know, regardless of if you identify as poly or monogamous, like we love more than one person in our lives. We're in a relational field together. And so I started to look at the framework of ending racism through attachment theory. Mm. And on the right side, I start to look at, oh, what is the culture of abandonment? Mm. And we might zoom into this in, in simply two questions. In what ways have I felt left behind? And the other question, in what ways might I have left others behind? And in the culture of abandonment, you will see each line is kind of, uh, connected. So how do we transform what is in the culture of abandonment to what is in the culture of humanity? He, he comes out for the good stuff. <laughs> this is Finn. <laughs> Sorry, the dog just joined us. Sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> so he's like, culture of humanity, I'm in. Um, so culture of humanity on the left side is what we're moving towards, what we're replacing racism with. And each of these is a skill set that gives us a framework for how we can connect more to being in loving relation with each other. And race, you'll see the word race is not present here. And yet the culture of racism is described in many ways here on the right side. And so, especially if you look at the bottom line, erasing ancestors and indigenous people through the creation and perpetuation of racism, right? And this is when we go to the culture of humanity, it is honoring ancestors and re-indigenizing. So I wanna pause because I know there's a lot here and I'm actually really curious um, what you all might be seeing or wondering as you look at this, I see a lot happening on folks' faces. I mean, that, I mean, Jill might have questions, but y'all might have questions too, and I welcome that. <laughs> Go ahead and speak up, popcorn style, if you like. I have all kinds of, I have a thing or two, but I want to see what other people have. I'm over here feeling like the, um old uh, San Francisco Chronicle examiner, pink man movie reviewer standing up on the chair going, yes, <laughs> oh yes, that's it. Oh. 
<laughs> Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Yeah. Love that guy. Um, I'll echo what Victor said and say, I really like this um, as well. A lot of my um, work in, in diversity and also in organizations has been rooted in the, con the African concept of Ubuntu. I am because we are, and I really see that philosophy echoed here in the um, culture of humanity. And as you go over to the culture of abandonment, there's you know, a lot within these um, values that are embedded into our organizations, our business, businesses, society, et cetera. And it's nice to see this juxtaposition um, on one, one diagram. Mm, thank you. See, I think I might've, um touched on this I can't remember in our conversation before um, I was just speaking with someone that I've been in conversation with about attending who said um, I can't show up for something that that uh, what were the words it was something like that um, foregrounds division and I hear that a lot in people who are in what I call a white supremacy mythology mindset, that one of the ways of avoiding dealing with systemic racism, with white supremacy mythology, one of the ways of kind of sidestepping, looking at it is to say, but, but, but that's division and we're all one. Um, and my perception is that um, this is coming from a very different place, obviously. Like you're not trying to sidestep that at all. Um, I wonder about um, the danger of somebody who doesn't want to reckon um, with, with racism, with white supremacy. And Victor says to add in culture of abandonment, scarcity slash zero sum consciousness. Yeah, rather than, rather than abundance. Um, Have you dealt with that at all? Or are you not worried about that? And if so why? Are you asking if someone is, is new to the conversation on race and they look at this and they're thinking, oh yeah, colorblind. Is that, is that the question? Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah just wanted to distill that. It's a great question. And then for, I just want to say one more thing that um, some people say I don't see color as a way of avoiding dealing with racism way of yeah, yeah. there we go so line three <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know also when I talk about moving from avoidance to care right because really what you're asking about is someone who is hiding out in the in the avoidance experience right um I I want to also say that the this um list of values is conceptual and the work is not just about mm. agreeing to the concepts here. The work is about a daily practice that we literally do in Waking the Heart, which is a community. It is about um, holding the question in my heart of where might I be on the right side in my life right now? And um, building awareness in our nervous system and I have relanguaged that as the present system because who wants to be nervous? So I'm calling that our present system, right? Is my present system here? Or is, is there harmony in my present system? Or is there a lot of agitation in my present system? And someone who is avoidant usually doesn't know they're avoiding something. That's not how they're tracking it, right? But what can be brought forth in this work because it is body-based and it is present system-based is to be in a field of people where there's deep listening and there's co-regulation happening and to bring more and more awareness to what is that experience of co-regulation mm -hmm. because it's hard to notice when it's not happening if we don't have a point of reference of what it is to be in a community where people are deeply listening and harmonizing their present systems. And so what happens in 
avoidance is that there can often be a sense of contraction, an immediate, like, oh, my attention suddenly isn't here in the same way, right? Those are the things someone might notice if they're new to a conversation around race. So, you know, and I was, I was kind of joking and I'll, I'll close this image for a moment. Um, I was, I was kind of joking with you, Jill, as we were preparing for this. I was like, you know, that person that you're asking about probably doesn't sign up for something called waking the heart of our human family, you know, <laughs> because, because the spirit of it is all, and, and I, I don't want to make, I don't want to reduce this to just like, just come to my workshop. I, I want to speak to how, how did I get to this being what race work looks like in the 22 yeah. years that I've been trying different things, right? Mm -hmm. And so the spirit of that is what's the invitation that calls us into more curiosity and care with each other? Mm. where there's enough presence, enough care, enough softening in our hearts that we can be with the trauma of what has happened and not lose sight of our connection and care with each other right now. And from that place, we can dream together and move forward together in a different way. Mm -hmm. So if I understand you correctly, I, I talk about dismantling white supremacy from the inside out and what i think what you're talking about is very deep and very broad and very um practice oriented way of caring for and attending to what's happening on the inside not just with ourselves but in the relational field with each other yeah I just, I'm just pausing for a second because I just noticed there's a, a chat here. Sorry, I'm a little behind. <laughs> I can read it out loud. Oh, yeah, that would be so helpful. Yeah. Sorry, it's hard for me to track both. Thank you, Jill. Yeah. So Debbie says, much of the quote unquote culture of abandonment is what I often see in Abrahamic religions, such as the God of the Bible saying, I am a jealous God, as well as the religious society defining desires fearing Eros, blaming things on Satan or original sin, entitled to be the chosen people or get into heaven, us, our religion, versus them and erasing indigenous people. Yeah, and I see there's more flowing in around this. There's definitely a place for certain ways that religion has played a role in that. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that we could point to religion being a, a source of culture of humanity, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's also possible. So I want, to, I want to name that too. And, you know, what I see is that this starts to stimulate us to look through the lens of the culture of humanity, you know, to look through that lens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And can you read what else is coming in yeah. there? Um, Victor says, fallenness and sin slash redemption or chosenness our religious and secular abandonment yes yes christian hegemony is most prominent christian has christianity has no prophetic tradition except borrowed from judaism mm. um, yeah oh, you know sorry is there more not oh there are comments <laughs> earlier in the thread too which might be helpful to read aloud sometimes when i'm scrolling up it goes too fast victor says colorblind is code for quote unquote innocent quote unquote power power blind and quote unquote culture blind mm -hmm. and naomi said erasing ancestors in indigenous people resonates because there was an intentional cutting off people from their roots in order to create and maintain a white supremacist, anti-Black racist system. Yeah. Thank you all for your contributions through the chat. Did I catch everything? Uh, Anything else? I think so. Hmm. I'm really curious. Go ahead. See, did you have something you're about to? Uh, yeah. I mean, I was going to speak to... Um, one of the things about my work right now is 
um, creating a goal and taking action. And so when I work with people it, through Waking the Heart, we spend the first few months just learning how to be together in this new culture, to not mm. prematurely take action from a place of abandonment, but rather what is it like to come in to literally learn a daily practice, to come into this, these places of co-presencing of, of um, Tonglen, actually, which was a Buddhist practice of breathing and suffering, increasing our capacity to, to stay present through suffering, mm. opening our eyes to experiences that are beyond our own personal experience, and to do that daily practice and to listen in deeply for three months before we even say, okay, here's how I want to take action. Mm -hmm. Because the way we're going to take action comes from a different place when we slow down together we come into presence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, um, uh, <laughs> you and I were speaking, Jill, about, you know, but it's urgent. <laughs> Shit's going wrong now and already has, right? And so what, what, where is the place for slowness in this, right? And, and I was thinking, you know, the way we take action from, from a rushed nervous system and urgent nervous system does not support our relationships with the depth that we need, because this is a lifelong, multiple, multiple generation transformation that we're up to when we're shifting this culture. And so, oh, thank you, Victor. <laughs> feel, feel you with me. Yeah. And so I, I, I also want to bring in the voice of Bayo Komalafe, who says, you know, and I hope I'm getting this accurate. This is my best paraphrase. My memory is, you know, these times are urgent. Let us slow down. Mm. Because underneath that urgency is the spirit of deep, deep care. Let us deeply, deeply care more than we have allowed ourselves to so far. There's nothing yeah. like a brain injury to get you to understand slowness. <laughs> so I hear that as care, care is the need, care is the thing that unites us. And urgency is a reactive strategy of an overstimulated nervous slash present, not so present, present system. Yeah. Yeah. Urgency is wanting us to look at something that maybe we haven't been looking at as closely as we need to. And our heart saying, hey, look at this. Mm -hmm. And then we breathe and we slow down and we come into what Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen would say, cellular agreement, right? We call mm -hmm. all those parts of ourselves in and we say, hey, now who are we together? Cellular yeah. agreement, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Oh. I, I'm calling it a an intricate science of presence. Mm. Mm -hmm. so I've um, done a similar thing in the 22nd Century Leaders Workshop where we spent the first six of the nine months just working on ourselves and what's happening inside before looking at how do we want to show up on the outside and a fundamental distinction between pattern and presence and where pattern is a set of our reactions and presence is that deep place from which we can discern, choose, move effectively and that sort of thing. And it feels to me like you're really expanding that, really, really opening up a space um, for people to become so deeply present so inhabiting their own present system with ourselves and yeah. each other and I'm guessing that like that so much wisdom comes out of those spaces just a wild guess yeah and then also you know <laughs> it's funny because sometimes as soon as someone sees oh this is the goal I want to play for this is the way I want to take action then they get uh, impatient, right? <laughs> Which is also a funny thing because it's like, how do we see the action we need to take um, and then continue to bring that gentle, continuous care to it? 
Wow. Okay. So I, I, I want to stop because yeah. Yeah. I've had this intellectual insight that I'll share with you in a moment. And I want to read mm -hmm. what Victor said too. Ah. Um, mm -hmm. We have time. We have time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can get excited sometimes. Um, so the intellectual mm. insight that I've been working with and holding and sitting with is that all of our human problems really come down to attachment to strategy. <laughs> and even mm. as I've had this intellectual insight, I've observed myself and not observed myself just kind of running off attached to all these strategies, you know? And I think what, what you're saying lands to me in my sort of cosmology uh, as really just kind of organically allowing those strategies to wiggle loose so that we can actually feel what's going on in our organism. Um, well, yes, and it's not a binary of strategy or feel. So I think, you know, I just want to pause for a moment and, and um, what the way that I see this work right now around replacing a culture of abandonment, replacing mm -hmm. a culture of racism with a culture of humanity mm -hmm. is that people do this deep listening and come forth with the inspiration. They see a possibility that lights them up for how they can contribute. Mm. And it needs to be specific. It needs to be precise. It, and in fact, sometimes it's dysregulating to care so much and not have a way to channel it into a physical mm. action. That in itself can be dysregulating. Mm -hmm. So to come into the clarity of, okay, this is the project. This is the policy I want to focus on. This is the relationship I want to focus on. This is the group I want to start or or, you know, to let that precision support us because that mm. allows the, the body to come back into harmony because we now have a place for that care to be channeled, right? Mm -hmm. And then to stay in, in a steady and gentle tending to that project, mm. that action, that it's not just like, okay, I saw the action and then boom, I did it this week. It is a it is a daily thing that we keep nourishing, like watering a plant in a garden. Mm -hmm. And so when earlier when we were speaking to, you know, urgency to come to action, it's like, yes, it, it is. We are melting that urgency to listen to the wisdom it's pointing to underneath it of what we need to care about. And then mm -hmm. as we take action to stay in that juicy resource place where we can continue to harmonize. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're going to need to course correct because that's what happens. That's the nature of bringing our dreams into the world is that they're going to be met with things we didn't predict. And so we have to also build in and, I, and I'm giggling at myself a little bit today because, you know, I'm working in this big healing ritual that's happening next week. And then some extra questions came up and I was like, I don't have time for this. I'm about to do an interview. <laughs> so I had to remember for myself too, like, of course they're coming up because there's a big project coming into a physical realm and it, and, that, and it is about race and it is about care. And so let me slow down and make an extra two hours that I didn't anticipate to make and still show up at the interview with you. But also what do I, what do I need to soften to remember how important that project is to me? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Something mm. Victor says here, wisdom, like the parasympathetic power, the, the, the settled nervous system comes on slowly unlike the sympathetic or stimulated nervous system rush of behavior that can't hold wisdom because it outruns the presence. Wow. Yes. Wisdom yes. requires, wisdom requires presence. Scope of strategy is bound by paradigm. Hmm. Also, when we spend more time in our parasympathetic space, it is easier for us to feel our grief 
It is easier for us to feel our connection and our eros. It is easier for us to feel these really deep heart communications. Mm -hmm. So in times when we get very upregulated, and if that's ever agitated in our present system, it's almost like it creates a bit of a buffer with our heart and what it wants to communicate with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I see there's a question. I see That's Jessica. Okay. As a, I see many. Great. Y'all are so engaged. Thank you. I'll, I'm going to relax into your guidance, Jill. <laughs> I, um, I only see six people up here. I saw Jessica's hand up and then Victor's. There might have been somebody's hand up before Jessica. So if there was, I apologize. Oh, in the chat. In the chat, there's a question too. I see. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me um let me call on Jessica first because I saw that Jessica's hand up was for a while, and then Victor and then David's question. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Z. Mm. Um well I I I wanted to just start out by apologizing for trying to do that from my car. <laughs> I got so <laughs> agitated when I when it was cutting in and out that I just decided to turn off my video and drive home. So now I'm home. Um, and mostly why I'm saying that is because I've, I'm so, well, there's two things. Like I can feel the limitations of my own nervous system and the way my nervous system gets activated so easily. And I can also feel my like deep, deep, like heart longing to be in these types of spaces. Um, And I'm also in (laughs) Resma's training, um, which started last week. So I've been sort of like, I've been in a bubble of it. Like I knew this was coming up too. So I've been in a bubble of it for the last like couple of weeks. And Mm -hmm. it's sort of like, there's something that I'm so like, sort of deeply craving and desiring. And also I can feel just so strongly my own limitations, like, coming up like they're just coming up like stronger than ever um and so I'm just I'm just holding those two things and I (laughs) guess just feeling so grateful just that the things that you're talking about and the words that you're choosing and I I just I resonate so deeply with the things that you're saying so um Mm. thank you (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for being able to observe what your heart is calling for and being able to observe where your present system currently is. Just simply being able to observe both of those things is already so important. And uh, yeah, I just saw you take a (laughs) breath and your system soften a little. Yeah. And um, I'm so grateful that you're part of the deeper listening that many of us that has called us all to this conversation right now. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I want to speak to as well is the metaphor of, you know, the outdoors nature is always there. It's the matter of when do I go outside and open the door and Mm -hmm. breathe it in. Mm -hmm. But when I'm inside and on the computer all the time, it's not like this goes away, Mm. right? And similarly, I want to offer the metaphor of there is always and there always has been part of our human family who has been in this conversation Mm. of deep care and deep healing and deep adaptability to move forward in a good way. Mm. And we are not alone. Mm. It's just a matter of when do we open the door and go outside and breathe it in. Mm. So Mm. one of the things I noticed in your share was that it started with your attention on yourself and your own experience. And I'm not saying at all that that's bad. It's just one of the things that can happen to every human when we get stressed is we drop into what's happening in me. And I want to invite us to open the door and walk Mm. outside and remember how much we're not alone, Mm. that there is a whole group of us here on Zoom right now. And there are other people at this very same time in the same inquiry to soften our hearts. And there have always been, and there will continue to be. Mm. 
And that is also part of what can invite us to soften into a more collective experience mm. when we listen to this frequency together. Wow. Yes, absolutely. Because I do think my nervous system rises up with this, like, oh, I have to do this all myself. <laughs> and then it, mm -hmm. I go into this crazy fight or flight. And so, yes, thank you. That is a beautiful, beautiful reminder. Yeah. And you're not alone. We all have that moment, that voice in our own ways. So mm -hmm. thank you for presencing it here in this way. Yeah. And for letting yourself soften because I, I see your being taking that in, in the last minute. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, could we go to Victor? Sounds great. Hi, Victor. Hey, um, everybody. <clears throat> Z and I met, I think over 10 years uh, ago and my first hit as a smug hyper intellectual was, oh my God, you're a fucking genius. Shit. <laughs> I believe everything you say, almost. Um, and <clears throat> uh, really, the uh, and it's, I'm just exploding with resonance today um, because the biggest, deepest thing that I think I've learned in the last couple of years of sitting with and listening to people since uh, the executions of uh, Ahmed Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, um, I met with over a thousand white people uh, that year. And I got that there's a power, a paradoxical counterintuitive power and just slowing the fuck down. As soon as it gets deep, as soon as it gets chaotic and that shit and oh my God, we have got to do something about this to fucking not. <laughs> Instead to slow down and pay more attention to what is uh, unfolding in the, in the nervous system and discovering that we can co-regulate with all this intensity yeah. and, and not do anything about it, not try to fucking fix it for crying out loud. And we, become changed in that process. And I have just had staggering discoveries. I'm always learning from the people that I do this with too. You know, I heard this white woman say, you know, we talked about, that, what do you call that? Um, the lost cause myth and all these post-Civil War mythologies that um, that we hear about and from the Gone with the Wind and uh, um, Birth of a Nation films. Um, you know, we're talking about that in this class and this woman who's baby boomer my age or a little older says, oh, uh, when I was growing up in the, in the Deep South, we, we just thought that was true. Mm. And I was like, what? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we can get all excited mm -hmm. and upset or whatever about this and I'm and I went, mm, wow. And she then she said, we just thought it was true. In fact, when I was five years old, we went to the uh, department store and I got a Robert E. Lee action figure, Robert E. Lee and his horse traveler. And I took him home wow. and, I was and I was like, what? Cause I never met anybody who had lived this. And I asked, mm -hmm. I had to ask a question and it was like a, a slow the fuck down question, which is, mm -hmm. what was that like for you? Yes, yes. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to add anything to this. I want to understand your experience. What was that like for you? She said, what? And I'm like, what was that like for you? And she kind of said, what again? And I said, what was it like for you to believe that? Because people who's, uh, who your life depended upon and that mm -hmm. you deeply trusted taught you that that was true. And then she couldn't speak. It was like the broken area of her brain became inactive. 
but her lips were moving. No words coming out, lots of redness in the face. And when she finally got the words out, I am furious. Mm -hmm. But only because we slowed the fuck down. And, and I was like, whoa. And you know, we were all transformed by that and not because <laughs> of ideology, but because we were sitting with experience in a way that I think you you you're speaking to as well. Cuz we, mm. we had a lot of curriculum, but whenever I always told that you know, we have a shit ton of curriculum in our hard conversations courses which are on hiatus, but we always said the curriculum is not the curriculum. All these videos and all these audio interviews and all these um, articles and PDFs and shit that's an on-ramp to the curriculum. The curriculum is us in real time, living together, co-regulating our nervous systems while contacting, putting our presence into that shit from history yes. to the present moment. And they're like, what? And I'm like, you'll see. Mm. <laughs> as soon as we get to the, oh my God, let's get excited and let's go real fast. I'm like, no. Let's slow the fuck down and watch what happens. And every time, every time, nobody believes it, including the people who are saying, let's slow the fuck down because I'm so smart. I'm always blown away. Like, oh, what the spirit brought in. Look at that shit. Yes. Uh, a big, long ass rant. But, you you know, you just, I always believe you. And it shocks me how I think you're just way ahead of 99% of your committed white kinfolk, serious. That's just me. Mm. That is me. Don't get the big hit. Thanks, Victor. I appreciate your perspective. And, you know, since it's about dismantling urgency, getting ahead of people ain't no thing. It's not even that helpful, right? Because we're not wrestling anywhere, right? It's it's how do we come back in a relation with each other? And I so appreciate what you're sharing because there's something that can become whole. And and it's and here's another thing too. It's not. <laughs> this might sound strange after everything that's already been said. The slowness is actually the result of being present. It's not just about the tempo. It's that we opened ourselves to be present to each other. And the slowness is often the result mm -hmm. <laughs> of that. Mm -hmm. Speak, speaking of that, um, I had mm -hmm. planned <laughs> to go <laughs> to talk with you for just about 40 minutes. And then we were going to go into the breakout rooms and formulate the kinds of comments and observations and questions that people already are speaking. And so mm. my um, inclination is to not do that, that I'm feeling a cohesion, a co-regulation, a gelling in this group as it is, even though it's a little bit larger than I would ordinarily invite that into and so I just want to check with you Z and with the group if you're okay with staying in this group instead of breaking out I see a thumbs up yeah let's ask the group and a nod yeah is there is anybody this... who really wants to go into a smaller group who would feel nourished by a smaller space to formulate your thoughts I can't see everybody I can see folks um but I'm not seeing anyone ask for that Okay. In this moment. Yeah. Okay. Then let's yeah. go ahead and stay with this. Let's, let's go with the proverbial flow. Um, yeah. See, so are you ready for another question from David? I am. I see. Yeah. I see our chat is growing and thanks <laughs> for checking in with where we're at in the group. Do you think your brain injury had the positive effect of helping you become more present and less attached in the Buddhist sense? If so, how has this affected how you approach anti-racism and racists with whom you interact? Uh, 
Um, let me go back to read that again. It's a, it's a big juicy question. Um, There's a co correction underneath the original one. He said anti-racists, but he meant yeah. racists. Well, thank you for that question. Um, there's no question that it has invited me to more presence. <laughs> um, and I think the biggest, it has inspired me to want to share presence with more people. Because um, being more present when a lot of the people I love are moving at the pace that I used to live has been an interesting tension. <laughs> and yet I so get it because I was like that too till I was laying in the dark for 10 months. Um, so that has been an interesting, an interesting uh, experience. In terms of less attachment, I gotta say, I don't really know that the Western interpretation of less attachment is really accurate mm. from what Buddhists mean because I'm so interested in attachment theory. And so I, at its simplest, I wanna feel like we're a human family. Mm -hmm. And that means, that means in my understanding, I wanna set aside the word, are we more or less attached? Mm. I wanna be interested in people's experience and I want to express and receive care mm. and so I don't think that's about avoiding attachment yeah I think I think um we have more uncertainty at, as a human family right now in this era we have more uncertainty than maybe many of us have had before last year before the last two years. And um, it, it is an interesting experience to how do we still move at the pace of trust? To use Adrian Murray Brown's phrase, move at the pace of trust. How do we still move at that slower, gentler, present pace in the presence of uncertainty together? And, and I, I bring that up because I think sometimes um, there's something about attach, attach and certainty that's, that's like dancing in the space for me for a moment because um, I'm really interested in rhythm and harmony. <laughs> the rhythm of coming back together, the rhythm of who are the friends I talk to every day or every week when I build groups or movements, there's a rhythm, right? It's different to um, know that we're gonna see each other again and we're gonna come back. And so the ways, the choices we make now are not in a vacuum. That's really important. Um, and the last part of your question, how it has approached the way I've approached anti-racism. Well, that's really what we've been speaking to a lot. Um, and I don't, I don't interact with people who are not, who are uncurious about racism. <laughs> to answer your question, you know, that's not, I mean, one of the interesting things that's happened in the pandemic is that for me, I've had more discernment about who I'm around. In fact, uh, there's been an absence of being in a lot of uh, public spaces um, in terms of how I've taken care of myself with COVID. And so um, I think that has actually supported me to weave more deeply and more sweetly with people because I'm really choosing where I'm focusing my relational time in a way that you know, was different before and you would go places and then, oh, hey, I didn't know I'd see you. But here it's like, we know who we're gonna see a lot more these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of an interesting byproduct of what's been happening. Yeah. I love that you, it sounds to me like are very, with a lot of discernment and care, you are curating your own 
social world and your own path. Um, and so you're not interacting with people who are uncurious about racism. Um, I love that and then I honor that. And I'm also working with white people who want to engage with the quote unquote other white people using this same kind of presence because my, my hypothesis is that white supremacy mythology braids with trauma and creates, you know, I would say mindsets, but really they're kind of nervous system or presence system states of, of, of non-presence of constriction. And that if we can bring that kind of presence and subtle body and curiosity to their uncuriosity, that that might be able to help them unravel these mindsets. I want to name something that just happened in the last two minutes is that the us them just came into the field. Okay, mm. so I just want to name it because it, I actually want to shift away from that context. Mm. Um, when I am talking about who I'm personally interacting with, that's one thing. But the way we started languaging it became like, you know, an us and them. And, and so to bring us back to the culture of humanity, um, it, is a, it is a human experience to, to have, um, to perpetuate systems that we may or may not agree with. It is a human experience, right? I need to humanize that. I need, I need us to understand that every human being has some understanding of what it is to be normalized and some understanding of what it is to be marginalized. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we address this in Waking the Heart is I literally give people like a four page inventory of their social location mm -hmm. and to notice in which ways and race and gender are on there. And so are a bunch of other things in the rest of the pages and to get folks to start to notice, oh, I know that experience of being, of being marginalized. So even though I don't have the same experience as a person of color, given that I'm white, I know what it is to feel abandoned in that way. I know what it is to feel invisible in the ways that I do. That's really important information. Right. Um, there are folks who, you know, so it, it brings us back to the heart of the question that we were trying to ask in the culture of abandonment language. Right. We're like, how do we talk to those white folks? Right. But to move that question into the culture of humanity language yeah. is how do we invite curiosity? How do we find a way to be in relation when we don't already start off believing the same things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to be clear, when I said the other white people, I meant it in quotes. Mm -hmm. Well, I was starting to do it too. We were both starting to go to that, right? And there was a split that happened in the mm -hmm. field. And so I was like, oh yeah, let's, let's bring the question to the, to the new paradigm, to the culture mm -hmm. of humanity paradigm. Yeah. And I'm curious too, did you notice the energy shifted in the group when we shifted the language of the question? I kind of want to do a rewind and look at that. Have other people notice? I see some nodding and then I see some folks who I can't tell actually. <laughs> Jessica raised her hand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just, mm -hmm. yeah, I was going to say really briefly, I can feel the energy shift. Mm -hmm is how I track it, I guess. It feels like something, it's even sort of wordless, but like I, I can feel it in my system when it shifts. Yes. It's kind of like these waves and it's like, oh yes. And oh, and it's almost like, even, even if the words are passing through me, there's something in the field that I can feel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Victor says yeah. I contracted around the word racists. I don't believe there is any such thing. Mm -hmm. It's that language is from the the uh, culture of humanity. Uh, I'm sorry, the culture of abandonment side. That language, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the conditioning is racist. Yeah, that's one of the mm -hmm. things that really kicked up um, for me. Like when Dylan Roof shot the nine black people in the church, and my 
white progressive friends were calling him a monster. I um, raised a, uh, a child on the autism spectrum who would have violent outbursts, destroy things, sometimes threaten me. And um, when I looked at the picture of Dylan Roof, when I looked at his eyes, I saw my child when he would get dysregulated. Mm -hmm. And I, I literally, I literally feared that my child would grow up to become a school shooter, not in a racial way, racially based way, but that kind of like dysregulation that will result in violence. And that was the turning point for me when I recognized that he and I are part of the same system. He's got a mom. Every, every, every white person who shoots is somebody's child. And it could have been my child. It could have been my kid. And so I started inquiring into how did this, the, the collective white psyche or the, the, the intersubjectivity that we're all a part of. And I started kind of tugging on my white progressive friends say, hang on a second. You know, before you want to, before you want to kill him and put him away, let's think about this. How did the same system that created him also create us? And how can we reach out as a member of this white human family to heal our collective white psychic pain? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking a question that comes from a sense of we. Mm -hmm. And thanks for presencing the way that we can split off from that. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, this work has been a lot about the paradox of, like, to give a sexuality example, how do female bodied people, women value our sexuality when to be valued for our sexuality is an instrument of our oppression? How do we heal differences when naming the differences in the first place was what started this whole mess or codifying them rather? Yeah, and also um, re, uh refocusing our language, uh, just like we did a few minutes ago, right? Refocusing our language to bring those questions forth in a way that is about us as a human family. Yeah. Yeah, and that could be a whole, uh, there's at least like three conversations that the door is just opened right now, right? So just <laughs> hold all of, all of that for a moment. Um, Mm. I want to speak to I keep um, thinking about this short film um, with my Angelo uh, speaking about kind of a version of what you said, Joel, in the sense of, you know, we all have violence in us. We all have care in us. We all have all those things in us. When you look at the abolitionism movement right now, the abol abolish the police movement specifically, and it's like, how do we remember that this is us, this is we? We're not here to just lock up something that represents what we're afraid, what we're afraid of, and think that somehow that's a solution for us. And I'm with us in the question. You know, I think part of part of it is connecting. Um, one of the things that we do in Waking the Heart is we practice relational fields. And that means literally learning how to shift which field we're perceiving. And we work with three, the relational field of self, what's happening in my, in, what's happening in my organism, 
my heart, my spirit, and my breath, and my present system. Now let me shift to the relational field of the group. What's happening with the 14 of us here in the Zoom and the flow, the facial expressions, and what's in the chat, right? Um, and then let me go to another perceptual field, the perceptual field of the human family, right? And there could be more than these three, but I simply I just simplify in waking the heart to only focus on those three. And we start to notice how often am I living life from each of these perceptual fields? Because for many of us, particularly many of us who've been socialized as white, we have actually lived a lot of our life not in the field of the human family. So how do we begin to practice orienting to that again? Because it is actually all three of them are self. Self as organism, self as our group right now, self as our human family right now. I was talking with Victor earlier today and we were talking about disconnect. Um, I've experienced a lot of disconnect in my life from other people. And um, I was thinking that, you know, if you map all of human history onto 24 hours, it would only be in about the last 15 or 20 seconds of that, that we've had the luxury to disconnect luxury, <laughs> the opportunity to disconnect from one another, because before that we were completely interdependent, you know, that mm. bison that you killed and you, the nuts that I gathered, and we had to rely on each other we were literally interdependent on one another for our lives and now we have the capacity to cut people out cut people off yeah mm, thank you i'm having a, a human transparent moment where i really have to pee <laughs> i'm gonna need to pause for a minute um and i also uh yeah, I'll be back in just a moment. And I trust y'all are going to do something awesome in the next few minutes. <laughs> Sorry, so you okay. have your hand up again. I just wanted to check and see. You can go pee while I, I line people up for you. <laughs> um, Victor, I see you have your hand up. I just wanted to check and see if anybody who hasn't spoken or hasn't spoken very much would like to um, come forth and interact with Z while we have them. Or when Lindsay comes back. <clears throat> Alfred, yeah. Alfred. So before you before you say, um, oh there I can see everybody now. Before you say what you want to say, is there anybody else who also would like to contribute or speak up, especially someone who hasn't? I'm just I'm listening in, in listening mode and I just want to I just did want to see the slide up again when when Z comes back if, if they oh. could that that value um, slide or I can I it? can put that up right now. I I, I actually put a link to oh, you it. Put a link. Yeah, so I can I can put it I can open it up and then share my screen. Okay. Yeah, and if you could put the link again, sorry I missed it. Yeah. Hang on one sec. It's an embody more love slash waking the heart with um waking the heart actually i can copy it hang on i'm right there now but i'm going to share my screen there it is great thanks yeah. And Victor, you were saying earlier, adding, like, adding to the culture of abandonment, zero sum game versus. Yeah, the, cr the critique of uh, the culture of scarcity is pretty integral to this whole, whole thing because we have to tell ourselves that there's not enough of what makes life awesome mm. to go along, go around for everybody in order to um, make you know, the madness seem legit. Mm, thank you, Victor. I like that. Ah, yes. Nice to see us back. I'm back. Uh, since I'm already talking, I'll just say one sentence. I, 
I, I so resonate with the sense of kinship and I I go so far as to say I believe that all no, notions of not being related and all notions of distant relationship are ideology and confusion. We are immediate family. Every single person in the human species is an immediate family member. And whether you're an ally and you're socialized as the oppressor or you're the underdog and getting a boot in the face, it's immediate family. It's immediate kin. Um, not like mommy, daddy, but more like sibling. We're all out here. We're just out here. And we are deeply and every single one of us com as completely related to every other person as we are to the people that, um, you know, the, 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 the womb of our mothers. Mm. And uh, Thank so, you. So, my, so my job that I've taken on for myself, my philosophy of life and li uh, religion is uh, seeing to the liberation of everybody in my family. Everybody. Mm. Not just me. Not just people who look like me, not just people who've been through what I've been through, but the people who are putting people who've been what I've been through, uh, what they get, I want to free them too. I feel like I have to because the oppressor, quote unquote, is not in their own, um, on their own devices within this constraints of their paradigm capable of freeing themselves. It's like a heroin addict freeing themselves from a needle. Why would they? They're going to, they're mm. going to, they're going to spike until they die what that's that's the game that's the game of mm. oppression it's people soil and green peace out mm, thank you i have a question for you victor and the group really if if zero sum and scarcity was on the right side what do you see as the left side the culture of humanity word i'm just abundance um mm -hmm. providence it's an old word but i think it deserves to be rec uh reclaimed that the world has enough of what we need mm. for it to be fucking awesome for everybody. That's probably mm. uh, in the secular sense, I suppose. Thank when you. I was, yeah, that's okay. Thomas when Paine, was, one of the deists by now. <laughs> when I listened to Jews on a Lonely Land as part of uh, uh, Keshet queer family camp through my, through my son's camp, Swanga, Jewish camp. Um, they were talking about what the Ohlone actually ate in the land that we were sitting on on this huge rock and where there were still like carvings from where they had used um, indentations in the rock to, to mash up acorns. Like they're eating acorns from the trees all around us and salmon from the creeks. And uh, there's not like the cultivation that like going to Whole Foods and thinking it's good for us to get a salad in a plastic container. They were subsisting on the land. Um, and tribal cultures today still subsist on the land and they eat giant, you know, caterpillary things. And it's, I'm not suggesting that we go out and do that exactly, but that there's so much abundance that we've become blind to because we, yes. have, to, we, we, we have the luxury of eating out of plastic. Yes, one of the core uh, practices in the daily practice for waking the heart is receiving. Mm -hmm. and this goes back to what I was speaking to you about earlier, Jessica, as well, that sense of receiving, because you can have so much um, mm, surplus of scarcity, interesting. Yeah, you can have so much around you and not actually be in relation with it, not receive the enough and so we literally come into, and this was actually something that um, one of the lead trainers for Peter Levine um, is uh, David, oh my gosh. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it. It's okay. I'm not remembering his last name, it starts with a B. Um, he also trains practitioners around brain injury and he was literally sitting with me doing these receiving practices and then it occurred to me oh wait a minute this is something that belongs in our larger work of moving forward together because many of us actually have not learned the internal choreography of receiving yet mm. Mm, mm. And so even when we're in the presence of love and the presence of people who want to join us in a way forward, 
in a better world, we actually don't know yet how to receive it. It's literally a somatic skill that no one has sat me down and walked me through until my brain injury. And in a way, being in the brain injury gave me the opportunity to explore at an organism level what it is to move from deep trauma to deep wholeness and Mm. inspiration. Mm. And so I could then translate that to my group relationships and to the human family relationships. That's what I'm sharing through Waking the Heart. Mm. Mm, mm, Yeah. And Alfred wanted to contribute and then Jessica. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say something earlier about something earlier, but I'd rather speak to what we just mentioned now. And the thought I had, as you mentioned that choreography is there's a huge part of it being too painful to receive uh, for, for, for fear of, you know, the unknown uh, for the hurt and disappointment that may come again and again and again. Uh, Why does someone say, stay addicted uh, if that's all they know and that's their, their place. Um, So there's a lot to to that trust. There's a lot to um, any other uh, abuse or trauma that someone's experienced that would even keep them from wanting to get on the dance floor uh, in that choreography. Yeah. Thanks for speaking to that. And that's why we start with levels. So uh, receiving can start with an object in your room that brings you joy. Because that for some people is nice and safe, right? A tree outside, oh, that brings me some joy. Let me learn something about receiving from that. And then as our system, literally that internal midline learns how to drink from that, then we can start to receive from a friend, a loved one, then maybe an ancestor, then maybe a larger field, then maybe every human being right now who's feeling inspired by the conversation they're in. Let me start to receive from that, right? Like so that we can actually start to um, discern what nourishment, what level of nourishment we want to drink from. And, And with that progression, gently and slowly increase our sense of it is safe to receive love. And we don't need to jump to ahead of where our system is at. We can just start with, oh, that tree right there, which happens to be an oak tree, <laughs> like the Ohlone folks. How can I just bring, drink in the beauty of that tree? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Jessica? Um, I'm, I'm inspired by your, your story of, I don't know, I can't remember what the words you just used, but you said moving from deep trauma to something, I can't, I don't know. Inspiration. Remember. Yeah, inspiration, right. Inspiration. Um, I think I told you this before, but I've had my own deep struggle with a mysterious chronic illness I don't really call it an illness, but whatever, after living in a moldy house and the way it like totally dysregulated my system, which is really interesting because the nervous system is on this like similar plane to, but different than whatever happens in my body when I, after living in the moldy house, like when I eat food and like all these strange things, like very strange experience. And the tools I was using to try to get out of this illness or whatever you want to call it was up until just very recently from the same trauma place Mm. that had sort of gotten me there in the first place. Mm. Um, So just now am I sort of diving back down into the roots of being here with you and other trainings and reaching out into sort of the collective and sort of finding this sort of vast network of um, connectivity 
to be the inspiration for my own healing, which really doesn't have that much to do with me. <laughs> I'm starting to see. Jessica, can um, you give an example? You said that the healing that you were trying to do came from the same system as the trauma. And my mind was trying to map onto like what an example of that mm. might be. Oh God, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, can you be more specific or? Well, I heard you say um, that you realized, I think I heard you say, maybe I got it wrong, that, the, um, that you had this realization that, that that the healing that you were trying to accomplish for yeah. what was going on with you was coming from the same trauma system. And so I didn't know if that meant Western medicine or, no. or um, the way that you approached it or any, what exactly you were. I think my to. own like familial trauma, you know, mm -hmm. and just my, my lineage and my, my mom and she was, she had a lot of, a lot of wounding and just sort of the imprints that, or inside of me from that was mm -hmm. sort of this kind of urgent panicked um, state, I guess. And so then when this very strange thing started happening to me, I didn't know what the heck was going on. And then I found out later that I'd been like living in mold and had done all the, just, just all, you know, and, and since then I've two years out of moving and living in mold and I haven't really like I've healed I've probably healed a lot more than I think but like it's the symptoms have not stopped and it's been years and so um it can be really frustrating and I guess I'm 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 moving towards and like looking towards the collective healing as mm. and being a part of that as like as my own healing sort of seems intertwined with the collective healing, I guess, is what, yeah. I'm, yeah. what Absolutely. I'm trying to say. Um, I'm just remembering Berger, Dave Berger was the name mm. I was trying to remember earlier. And I, and I also want to say, um, yeah, healing can happen at any of these relational fields at the, at the collective human family field and the, um, in the group field, it can happen um, in the organism field, right? And there's a thought coming in. I've been listening for the right words here. Um, I think I think there may be a misunderstanding of trauma as if it's the reason we don't have the life we want. And yet trauma is actually how I understood more about connection mm. and resilience and deep adaptability. And so I don't want to position trauma as the obstacle mm. for the quality of love and care that we want to be living with. I think it is an incredible opportunity, right? Like these deep research that came from those 10 months that I was in deep recovery because I wasn't getting blood circulating fully to my brain right and I don't want to romanticize that it is challenging and yet um, it offered the right ordeal for me to have the wisdom that I can now share with you mm -hmm. it offered the right um, space for my heart to learn how to grow in a way it wasn't before mm -hmm. that allows me to be here with you now Right. And that is something that I think uh, we can get curious about trauma and not make assumptions or lump all trauma into the same thing. Because for many of us, uh, it is our bodies asking us to slow down and become present in a way we haven't been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to um, introduce a word into the room mm -hmm. and um, maybe a couple words. Well, the word that I thought of is belonging. And I've been reading mm -hmm. Tokopa Turner's book, Belonging. I read it once and I've been going back to it. I've been doing her dream work. 
And mm. um, she talks about belonging as a skill set. And Matt Licata's work also talks a lot about um, welcoming in the exiled emotions. She echoes the same kind of thing, like um, um, belonging, allowing the parts of ourselves that we reject like a scary dream to also belong. Mm -hmm. And I, I see, um, I see uh, that we are kind of fractal representations of the culture that we're in, each of us, our interactions. And one of the things she said just stopped me in my tracks and I think I'm still starting to get it in layers. And that was um, the inner world she says, is a macrocosm of the outer world, not microcosm. Our inner world is a macrocosm of the outer world. And I feel like I'm still grokking that. Like, I, 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 I. <laughs> but what I think, where I think she's going with that is that as we allow these exiled parts to re-belong as we remember these parts of ourselves and we bring them into co-regulated duos and trios and small groups and large groups that we actually um, create, we actually pro-culturate, we, we create the field of possibility for that kind of deep change and for others to mm -hmm. also reorganize their systems. Yeah, yeah. And then to find our purpose and action from those reorganized systems, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's kind of different stages to this. You know, one stage is simply coming into this rhythm and harmony with ourselves and in the relations we have. Right? A lot of people, after doing the daily practice for several months, the things that came forth for them to take action on were relational repair with their, with their close friends or with, or with communities they had given up on. Right? That's how we can tell that it's working. Right? Some people were like, okay, I, I want to I point to the outcome as well because the co-presencing is foundational and also so is the then taking purpose to action from that rhythm of co-presencing, right? And they feed on each other. Um, and so there were also folks like the final, the kind of final projects and goals that people in their regulated systems came to see when they could really, they, the energy was freed up and available for their heart to bring them to clear action was often something, it wasn't necessarily what they thought they would be focusing on. It was a lot about, um, oh, I need to actually show up differently in my biological family to be congruent with my values, or I need to start a space, um, a BIPOC space as a BIPOC person, because I see where it's missing and where I want that to be more available in my kink community, right? Like these are examples of, of people saying, I've got an abundance of co-regulation in my life. I've got enough co-regulation in my life that I can actually now root this energy into a new project. And so, yeah, I mean, the heart of really what we were building together as a group was trust, compassion, and generosity, those three things and the felt sense of them. You know, so like to come back to, oh, this is what it feels like to trust that I'm going to see these folks each week in this way. And we're going to look at that beautiful map of values together. And we're going to genuinely ask, where have I been living on the other side? And how can I shift it, right? We're going to come together in that very authentic curiosity. And we're going to co-harmonize. And we're going to listen deeply for how can I serve we're going to be in that question because we know how to look at the all the relational fields of organism and group and larger human family. And when I know how to look through those different perspectives, when I ask then how can I serve, I can see more clearly. 
Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So there's kind of a, a rhythm and a, and a, a structure with an outcome. And so I think it's important to hold both the quality of presence and the results in the physical world that happen. Because I think some spaces just go more towards one or the other, and they're both really, really important. And they feed, they feed each other actually. Yeah. Victor says the mutual presence work creates a collective and internal crucible for transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. both and I'm so curious what questions are coming up for you all because I know this has been such a big expanding conversation and I'm like what are the questions in the hearts in our group right now <laughs> yeah not these aren't things you hear every day I don't think how are they landing in your brains and hearts and bodies and elbows and collarbones i'm feeling the lightness yeah and then and for the first time i remember in a book i read years ago 20 years ago the unbearable lightness of being mm. Mm. See, one of the things that I love about you and I'm appreciating about these days getting to talk with you is how you hold this, this levity as a vehicle for such um, gravity and that, that mm. um, it feels that feels kind of alchemical to me in and of itself. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, says, you know, I see. Oh. I just see a hand up from there, Shana. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> I have big emotions. I've been told that by um, people who actually understand such things. I used to think it was just something wrong with me. And I always struggle with when I have feelings come up, balancing um, the shame about having big feelings come up when we're doing work. So at some point, um, we, we were talking about the conversations we can have in, in good spaces. And I thought my mother who was autistic and I didn't know she was autistic until a year before she died at age 93 actually could have those kind of conversations, but she couldn't bring it up. You had to bring it up <laughs> with her when it was just two people or really, I really just her and you. And then she could talk about, and she was so open-minded and open-hearted, but she didn't share any of that. And so I had come up all this, oh my God, I could have done all this work I do with my mother when she was here, if I'd known it earlier, oh, how sad that is. And oh my God, I don't want to leave the group to have all these feelings of mine. I want to be, I don't want to miss any of this juicy stuff we're talking about, <laughs> but I also don't want to stuff down that I had this awareness about um, something that would have been beautiful that I missed. And I often have things not that intense, but come up when I want to be <laughs> um, contributing to making a difference and making sure I don't miss any new piece of information that could help me make a difference later um, and having my own experience come up or my own feelings come up. And um, I guess I feel safe enough to say that here. So uh, thank mm. you for that. But that thank is you. a thing for me. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I have I have two different thoughts. Um, one is I'm aware that autism has come up a few times in this space, and I'm so grateful because I think it impacts way more people than we talk about and than we realize. Um, and I am just so it's so important that neurotypicality uh, step aside for a more holistic view of of our human family. So thank you for that. Um, and. I'm doing a healing ritual around autism next week, and it's not a public event. And as I listen into this group, if it's something you want to know more about, message me and we can see if that might be aligned. So I'm just holding that. Um, the second thing I want to speak to is emotion. 
And what I love about your question, Darshana, am I saying your name right? Darshana. I usually say Darshana because I was Darshana English in America, but I really prefer it when people who um, are more familiar with Indian culture say Darshana because it's so much better. Okay. But it doesn't okay. come off my tongue that way. So either one is good. Okay. I changed what I really years ago. Ah, thank you. What I really appreciate is that the way you ask the question tells me you already observe that you have some choice around what you're focusing on. Because mm -hmm. you noticed, oh, sometimes I could focus on this, sometimes I could focus on this. That already tells me that you know that you're not your emotions, that you have emotions, and that there's a sense of where do I want to focus. And I love that because that's already more skilled than a lot of folks might have, right? And in asking that question, what the emotions are part of our wisdom. They're, they're pointing to something that is really important. And sometimes I think, and I've noticed this more in Western culture, I think sometimes people are looking at, am I expressing it or am I stuffing it down? And that's not the question. <laughs> the question is rather than looking at that scale, the question is, what is this emotion asking me to look at that I might not have been looking at? That's a different question. It moves through our present system in a different way. And there's a little more spaciousness around that question. And so ultimately, when all is said and done, and we have passed on and we are dead, people, it's like, what do we want to be remembered for? And it's not just, oh, here lies Z. Sometimes they were angry. Sometimes they were sad, right? Remembering through the lens of emotional expression. It's more like, here lies Z. They saw a possibility for how our human family could be with each other. And they devoted their life to exploring joy and looking at that possibility. And yes, along the way, different emotions would come up as he did those projects, right? It's like, where is the big focal point? And I imagine all of us have something that brought us to this conversation where we are curious in some way of how race and our relation to race, is there any way that we could be relating to race differently that would allow us to contribute what we came here to contribute to our human family? And to make space for the emotions that support that contribution to remain a thing that is deeply important and well tended to. And so one of the, you know, I am all for uh, the seeing our emotions as allies and helping us see what's important. Um, and you know, I think what a unique experience you spoke to, Darshana, to have discovered that your mom was autistic at the very end of her life. There is something that I imagine you know that I will never know. And so for you to also take that time to grieve and be with the emotion of that is also important because that's going to access wisdom that we also need in the human family. So I want to speak to that too. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Thanks for bringing that forth. It was a gift and I was an only child. So it was just me and this woman who I think probably had Asperger's who other people mm -hmm. thought was difficult. You know, uh, mm -hmm. we had a real <laughs> last year, by the way, after uh, my partner at the time pointed out, gee, I think your mother has Asperger's, you know, like my nephew. And I was like, 
oh my God, all those weird things about her. Her brain works differently. Oh, mm -hmm. my sweetheart. Oh. And every time I, you know, was with her then, which was every day, um, <laughs> I really like uh, tender. Because yeah. I no longer had any, oh, is she going to yes. be sarcastic? Is she going to hurt my feelings? Is she going to not connect with me in love, what I wanted for my whole life? Um, but it was like, oh, she's already, this is, all I have to do is be tender and she's connected. Mm. No, anyway, mm. it was, it was, really, wow. she was really a gift and, um, but I just wish we'd had more time to enjoy it, you know? Yeah. And uh, that sort of thing. But, um, Thank I just you. noticed that we oh. we have 14 minutes left, and Julie, I know you've had Thank your you. hand up, and then see. Thank you, Darshana. Hi. Hey. Um, I was just the the whole piece of the, what happened earlier of z mentioning that like you don't fill your time with people who are not curious about anti-racism and doing this kind of work and then where that all <clears throat> led to um just stimulates in me um that balance point of um, self-care, I guess, because um, that feels really alive for me is like, where do I draw the line? Like, I think the idea of seeing a human family is in that like colorblind, culture blind, power blind um, uh, kind of idea is not being able to discern and um and i think sometimes that in my life has led to like feeling like i need to keep putting energy in places that um in conflicts and things that are not going anywhere and uh bring me out um and so yeah i just really love all of the pieces in this conversation of like slowing down um, and yeah, like where it's um, holding us as a human family and also keeping our eyes open of seeing where we're all at, why and where, you know, the reasons why we are where we're at and not holding ourselves as not related, but also being honest about what our capacity is and what feeds us and what is pleasurable and what is a pace that's sustainable. And um, so just really that kind of like a synthesizing piece of all the things that have been brought here. I just really appreciate the, the depth and nuance that you're um, watching on. Yeah, thank you. Stimulates any more things for you to share, but yeah. Well, I want to speak to something about the daily practice, and um, you know, uh, it's one thing to say, "I'm going to drink some water because I'm thirsty." It's another thing to say, "I'm going to drink some water so I have more energy to be here with my community in conversation." Right. It's another thing to say, I'm going to drink some water so I have more presence and energy to do the work in the world that I want to do. Right now, it's all the same drinking the glass of water. Right. And one could say it's all self care. And yet, the self is all these levels. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times we get stuck in this place of, self-care versus caring for others but but we could laugh at how that isn't a real question right <laughs> because now we've been in this conversation but but some people still ask it in that way right and yet 
And yeah, and I, I love that you're drinking water now, Dar. So yeah, <laughs> great. And so every time that I say, oh, let me get a good night rest. Oh, let me go make time to grieve about my relation with my mom. Let me realize that those things are also so that that does contribute to the human family. It is not, it is not separate from. And some people in the group, when it came to what is the final goal or project that we're looking at, you know, there's someone nine years into ALS, which is longer than most people live with ALS in our group, one of my closest friends, right? And we had to look at what is the right goal to play for, for you, right? And she was losing her ability to speak literally during the two weeks that we were coming to the close of our time, right? And so what is the right goal? Because if the goals we're playing for are too big, we experience pressure, right? And if the goals we're playing for are too small, then we don't feel engaged enough in our life. So there's a skill in what's the right size goal, given where my attention is, where I am currently tending to my relations, what is the right size goal to focus on where I can experience that gentle and continuous sense of progress that represents what's important to my heart? And so around race, you know, what is the, what is, how do I want to demonstrate my How do I want to demonstrate my sense of our wholeness that is past the, all the ways that race has separated us or created internalized inferiority and superiority? How do I want to demonstrate that we're coming back into human relation with each other from our hearts? How do I want to demonstrate that today? What would someone who cares about that do next this today? You know, these are, these are different questions to, to engage with. Yeah, I'm aware we're in our last eight minutes and I'm so grateful. And, and uh, yeah, see, thanks. I love your mic. <laughs> thanks. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Um. I'm just feeling so grateful to have been able to witness um, this um, amazing facilitation and the way that you've held space for us as we've traversed so much ground and you know so many parallels and so many different levels and I'm just um kind of like letting it all sink in and um appreciate the way that we've opened a safe container and offer people to talk about their own personal traumas and family patterns and recognizing the way that this all comes into the way we show up when dealing with how do I want to um you know, face racism and um, it's just, yeah, I'm just really grateful and um, also um, admire the way that you have talked about choosing which emotion to embody as, a, you know, the most continuous emotion that you're reaching for and, and bringing that into the, the fields that you're, you know, traversing and, and um, you know, that idea that people don't remember what you said or what you did, but they remember how you, you know, they made you, you made them feel. And um, I just, yeah, I'm just really grateful and I'm, I'm taking that moving forward and um, yeah. I want to go to all the workshops that I can that you're in, <laughs> that you're part of. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here. I have a desire to do some breathing together and, um, and maybe some closing words, but just, just be together for a moment in these three fields. Um, actually, to do three breaths and to get a kind of a felt sense of 
this experience that we're talking about. So I wanna invite us in a moment to take three breaths. The first one will be to drink in and to nourish our own organisms with anything that has moved or inspired you in this time. And the second one will be to, to breathe in as a group, a sense of appreciation that we've come together in this conversation. And the third breath will be to send some sweetness out to our human family. So those are the three breaths. So taking a moment to really relax, notice if there are any small adjustments you wanna make in how you're sitting that will allow you to have more connection through the midline of your body from the top of your head down to the floor of your pelvis. And relaxing and exhale, emptying our breath so we can breathe together. And breathing in nourishment to your own organism. Drinking that in. And then breathing in, letting our whole group breathe together in appreciation for coming together in this way. And our last breath to send some of the sweetness of this time out to our larger human family. Mm. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Joel, for inviting me to this conversation. And thank you, Z, so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for for showing up and co-creating this this beautiful space. Um, we have two more minutes. I think I have the um, link to Z's program I'm going to put here. I'm going to ask if it's okay if I email you all in the future about related events. Um, if it's not, you can tell me or if you get it an email from me and you don't want to get any more, you can get off the list very easily. Thank you so much, Jill, for your leadership and hosting uh, and creating this uh, conversation venue. It's a critical work and Thank you for bringing the of all people in the whole world. Oh, people. <laughs> yes, I think can we get a copy of the yeah. chat? I think so. I'll figure I'll I'll try to figure that out. I'll ask my, my tech support person and life partner, David, to help me figure that out. <laughs> we have one more minute. Thank you. Click in the chat, click in the chat, select uh, select all copy, and then you can paste it somewhere, but we'll also send it out. That's the quick way if you want to do it yourself. Mm. Victor, I appreciate your contributions. I appreciate everyone's just presence and words and facial expressions. Yeah, thank you, you all. Yes, and uh, may we, you. may we, yeah, may we meet again in uh, another space that nourishes us. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. You well, everyone. I'll be on afterwards if you want to talk more about any um, other incarnations of this work or <laughs> anything. We'll have a little, little after party. Uh, peace okay. and grace. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Paula. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Z. You look um, kind of extra peaceful and glowing even. <laughs> uh.
Uh, thank you. We got some good yeah. juju going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that your crow or raven? The meaning is it coming from? Yeah. That looks yeah. Like such a beautiful it's place. I'm having um, outdoors envy. Regenerative for me. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, dear ones. I'm gonna go rest. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. I need to get a bite to eat before my next thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs>